Okay, good morning. This is another uh, practice test that we're going to take um, for the IED final. And uh, this is the um, particular document here in question. I had it open, and it's the uh, Part A uh, PLTW exam. It's one of the attachments that's inside of our uh, practice materials folder that we've created on the Google Drive. So let's go ahead and uh, knock this exam out. Um, who is responsible for is number one? Uh, and also a reminder, sorry, before I do the questions, um, a reminder, it says closed book, closed notes, but you will be able to use the PLTW formula sheet. The uh, first three pages of the formula sheet are relative, relevant excuse me, to IED, uh, and you will also be able to use a calculator, but you will not have any other notes or any other resources available to you. All right, so number one, who is responsible for designing most products used in today's society? Well, uh, if you hopefully know that by now, uh, it's going to be engineers. So number two, what is a step of the design process that involves reassessing the design specifications, implementing modifications, and updating drawings. Okay, well, uh, reassessing and design specifications uh, involves reassessing, involves uh, implementing modifications and drawings. That would be optimization. Optimization would be the name of that. Uh, which of the following is represented by the diagram of the right? So if we have an input, process, output, and then some feedback, that's a closed loop system because there's no way to get out of this particular loop, closed loop. Um, what engineering method uses a logical sequence of steps that begins with a specific problem or perceived need and results in a solution? That's the design process. What principle of design involves gradual change from one feature of the design to a to another? That's transition. Just based on that, that's kind of sort of a common sense question right there, basically. Gradual change from one to another. Uh, none of all these other things here mean that. Okay, so next page. Right. What principle of design is being considered when sketching a bicycle tire in relationship to its to the size of its frame? Uh, proportion would be the uh, correct answer there. Um, we don't want to sketch a wheel and then have a frame that's super tiny unless it's a bike from 1920 or something like that. Uh, all right, number seven. A blank is a list of the topics covered in someone's written work. A uh, list of topics would be a table of contents. Um, Whereas the others would not be, you know, the closest thing to it would be an appendix, but an appendix is really just sort of an addition of, you know, usually it's like data tables or graphs or other information that's relevant to the particular document. Uh, but the list of things that are, that's in the written work would certainly be the table of contents. Okay, number eight. An organize, organized collection of your best work during a class or a major project is called a what? Well, you know, design diary is pretty close. Engineering notebook is something that's personal to that. Um, what you would actually be submitting there is a portfolio, and that's where you submitted when you did the puzzle cube project. So it's a portfolio. All right, number nine. What type of line is used in orthographic sketch to project the size of an object from one view to another? Uh, that would be a construction line. Um, it would not be anything else as far as, you know, extension lines are used for dimensions. Object lines are actually used for the object, and the section line is used when you're showing the interior of an object. So it would be a construction line to show that. Okay, identify the sketch to the right. Uh, this is hopefully should be really easy for you to spot. You got one here, we got two here. All vertical lines and no horizontal lines. That is a two-point perspective drawing. So number 10 would be that one, okay? Next page. Uh, in this particular here, what, what you got here, we got three-dimensional sketch. It's uh, drawn true to size and its height and width, but foreshortened in its depth as uh, shown in the right. So. Um, this one we, we didn't spend a lot of time covering in, in, in our classes, uh, but there are two types of, this is, this is an oblique drawing, and there's two types of drawings that are considered oblique. One of them is called cabinet, and one of them is called cavalier. Uh, cabinet oblique is the one where the uh, depth is foreshortened. Cavalier would be a true depth. So this particular drawing would actually have double depth if you were to use it as a cavalier, so it would look, look more like that um, based on, yeah, something like that. Okay, I'm just drawn with my mouse, so, you know. Um, so it would be a cabinet problem, okay. Uh, number 12, a line touching an arc or circle at only one point is perpendicular to the arc's radius uh, would be a tangent, okay. Only at one point, perpendicular to the arc's radius. Okay, number 13, what are the relative coordinates of point D if you're moving from point B? Okay, so remember, relative is a change, right? So if you're going from point D, Sorry, if you're moving. From, sorry, I'm trying again. If you're moving from point B and going to point D, you're basically asking or answering the question: How far this way do you have to go? And then also, how far this way do you have to go to get to that point? Okay. So for this particular case, we have, are going to use let's see, one, two, three, four, five to the right and one down. So that would be choice B. Choice B would be the relative coordinates. If it was absolute, the answer. If, the, if you were asking. Absolute coordinates that would be four, sorry, eight, four, 
for point D, and that's why one of the extra choices is indeed 8, 4. But since they want relative coordinates and the underline relative coordinates, the answer they want is 5, negative 1 there. All right, so next page. All right, number 14. What type of polygon does the adjacent picture represent? Uh, this particular polygon here is inside of a circle. This is an inscribed polygon. Okay? If the circle was inside the polygon, it would be a circumscribed polygon. All right, 15, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. We all know what that is. What is it an example of? It's an example of mathematical modeling showing a relationship between two quantities. 16, uh, what is created by blending two or more unconsumed closed profile sketches located on work planes or planar faces? Hopefully you know this. It's uh, everyone's favorite loft uh, feature. And you can sort of, you know, kind of look at these and eliminate the possible choices and hopefully leave yourself with just the loft uh, as your choice there. Uh, number 17, what is a type of modeling that helps to define the scope and limitations of the design problem before the significant time is invested in the development of a prototype? Well, that would be, of course, um, that would be, of course, modeling. Of course, what kind of modeling is the question? Uh, if you're just kind of defining scope and limitations of the problem before time is invested in the development of an actual prototype, okay? Well, conceptual modeling, mathematical modeling, graphical modeling, physical modeling. I think I'm going to go with graphical modeling on this one. Although, this, you know, the, the verbiage in the question is a little confusing, uh, but graphical modeling would certainly be the idea. The idea is that you want to, you know, design it virtually, make sure it works and is going to make sense both geomet geometrically and realistically before you go ahead and invest time and work on an actual prototype. So, graphical modeling would be my uh, my best. Uh, assumption there. Okay, uh, you'll notice I had the bottom of that last page crossed out. That's because I accidentally copied too much of it. This particular question here is 18, uh, and here's the answer choices, and here's what the problem is. The uh, process of making a candy mold shown above illustrates how to create something using in a 3D modeling, sorry, 3D solid modeling software. Okay, well, you have a part here, you have another part, and you put them together, and then you sort of take it away and get yourself a new part. Uh, this would be called a derived part. Um, you would think it's going to be, you know, adaptive part, but this part, you know, is kind of a combination of these two. So you would derive, anytime you derive something, you know, you're coming up with it from something else uh, on there. So uh, derived part in there. However, I will say just in this video, um, I'm pretty confident it's not B and it's not C, although I, it's also possible that it might be A. So I'm going to put a little question mark here to kind of remind myself to look that up and post on the comments of the Edmodo video about whether or not I did in fact get this right or not. Okay, number 19, in computer modeling, the process of drawing lines, circles, arcs, and rectangles to create basic profile defines approximate size and shape of features in a part. That's referred to as sketching. Hopefully we get that all. If you see that question again, you're going to get that one right, we hope. All right, number 20, placed features such as blank, blank, excuse me, <laughs> I went French on you. Placed features such as blank and blank are edge treatments applied to a 3D model. So we've done enough of these. Uh, that we hopefully should know the answer to these, but the answer is fillet and chamfer. Okay, fillet and chamfer. All right, next question, or next uh, page. Okay, 21. What is a full-size physical model that is functional and can be tested? That's a prototype, different from a mock-up. A mock-up is not necessarily fully functional. All right, 22. Work planes that are created parallel to an existing surface and specified distance away from that surface. That's an offset work plane. We've used quite a few of those in our modeling uh, projects this past few market periods. Okay, when is a group of parts, or sorry, when a group of parts is pre-assembled and bought into a larger group of parts as a single unit, you refer to that as a sub-assembly, like what we did with either the button maker or the automobile car. Fourth market period. Number 24. If we use a mate constraint applied to between the two opposing surfaces of assembly, how many degrees of freedom will remain between the parts? Well, if you mate these two faces, you're now preventing their rotation and their movement along the vertical plane without moving it into each other, of course. So you've removed two degrees of freedom, so you would have four remaining. Keeping in mind that there are six degrees of freedom originally between two parts before any constraints are applied. All right, number 25. The simulated movement of assembled parts through a variety of specified steps is accomplished using which of the following? So, movement of cellular parts through a variety of specified steps is accomplished using the following. Um, those would be uh, drive constraints. So we didn't specify, or didn't talk too much about this, but uh, if we did some further research into the train project, we would use drive constraints to dictate movement or simulate the movement of the object along that train track. 
Alright, so that's a good question to know. So it's a good thing you're watching this video, because that's something that we did, you know, and, you know, and remember, of course, we're not always covering, covering every, every, every single little thing that we possibly can. We try our best to get as much as possible, you know, get the breadth of material, so that when it comes time for exams like this, if you get a question like that, you have enough information, sort of enough background knowledge to kind of guess what the answer most likely is. Alright. Uh, 26, what is the maximum number of bike frames you can ship in one box at one time if the Postal Service has a 20 pound limit per package and you got a bike frame with the following mass properties, mass, volume, and area? Okay, so here's the, so the question basically is asking us to, to determine uh, how, how much this bike is going to weigh. Okay. Well, according to our formula sheet, we actually have a, have a formula for that. Um, we have the, if we, if we know what the mass of the object is, and we know the volume and area, we can actually calculate some of those things. And we have a formula sheet for that, so we're going to use that first. Of course, in this particular problem, you'll notice that uh, what's a little tricky is that they tell us the mass is a 5.67 pounds. Well, that's really a, a weight, right? So, um, you know, it's, it, it's actually an easier question than it, it lets off to be with the volume and area problems. So if you've got a 20 pound limit, you divide this by the weight, you'll see that you're only going to be able to fit three bicycles into that um, and also they don't really specify any size limits so we really don't need the volume in the area too much on here we just need to use the weight so in this case uh, we do 20 pounds divided by 5.67 it's gonna be something a little bit greater than 3 um, but not 4 and you obviously would have to be 5 pounds for it to fit exactly 4 so our choice the correct choice here is B also you notice that you know 4 is not one of the answer choices so it can't be 4 um, but 3 would be the correct answer for that one okay so we got number 27 now. Uh, what's the permissible amount of dimension can vary using the manufacturer of a part and have the part still be usable? usable excuse me. Uh, that's the tolerance range. We spent a lot of time talking about tolerance at the beginning of the marking period, so hopefully uh, that's a question you knew right away. Uh, which of the following terms describes minimum clearance space between two mating parts? Uh, you know, again, we did it in activity. That's the allowance of an object. Okay, we talk about allowance. Also, not allowance, but also govern interference as well as clearance. Uh, remember, we talked about negative and positives there. All right, number 29. What in the purpose of hatch marks or section lines in an orthographic short drawing is to show either material, texture, dimensions, or finish? Okay. Well, one of the purposes is actually to show the material, show where things are. So if you, you know, if you're cutting away part of a part to show where the inside of the part is, that would be the purpose of using section lines. Okay, number 30. A cutting plane is needed to create which of the following views in an orthographic drawing. Okay, so once again, we talked about this in unit 7. Um, a section view is what uses a cutting plane. Remember in Autodesk we had to do the you know, section view by first specifying the cutting plane and then pulling the view to another side. Alright, 31. When creating an assembly in 3D modeling software that includes a base plate, cover, nut, and bolt, which component would you like to place first? Well, think about this, right? You, you always want to start with the biggest part of the assembly, right? So which of those items would certainly be the, bi the be the biggest, and that would be the base plate. Okay, so you want to use the base plate for sure. It's something that's on the bottom, you ground it and then place everything else around it. 32, which drawing view we use most appropriate to use if an important feature or part was too small and complex relative to the total part size? You would use a detail view for this. Think of it as like, you know, we're zooming in on a specific, spar uh, specific spot in the part. Uh, number 33, which drawing view would be necessary when the interior parts of an object are complex and not visible from any view? You would use a section view to show that. All right, number 34, moving on up here, we're almost done. 34, which of the following views would be needed to show the actual shape of an inclined surface? So we use that in auxiliary view. We did not do a specific activity using auxiliary views, um, but understand that if you saw one, it would be on a sloped or curved or inclined surface. All right, 35, what information is missing from the following annotation of a counterboard hole? Well, if we have, according to this, it's hard to see on here, but it looks like it's six holes that are through diameter 0.5, and then it, we, what, what do we need? Well, we have the outside diameter, we have the inside diameter, we have the depth being through. We do not know how deep that counterboard goes, so we would need to know the counterboard depth for this problem. Okay, all right, last five questions coming up. What guideline would be which should be followed for creating slides using a presentation software such as PowerPoint to communicate your design idea to the audience? Okay, well, um, let's see here. <laughs> There's a couple of options here. Slides with contrasting colors is always a good point. That's kind of a small font, so B would not be it. Slide transitions and many sound effects can actually be a little dis disconcerting to people, and of course, putting white text on white background would be pretty silly. So choice A would be the correct choice there. Uh, 37, what type of inexpensive physical model could be used in a classroom presentation? Uh, mock-up would be the correct answer here, a mock-up, uh, inexpensive physical model. 
And then number 38, what's a department within a company that develops new products or redesigns existing products that would be research and development? HR would not be responsible for that. Uh, 39, the production, sorry, production process known as blank is when products materials arrive at a manufacturing facility and are used right away without the need for long warehousing time. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, this particular one here, I believe it's JIT actually. Uh, JIT would be the correct one. Uh, the other one in possibility would be Congruent Engineering. So there's another question I'm going to want to research um, on here, but I believe it's actually JIT. So I'm going to double check. Uh, that's going to be another one of those I'm going to mark off right here just to make sure. And I'll put in the Edmodo post when I uh, whether this is correct or not. And number 40, what data collection process is used to determine how much money is needed to design, manufacture, package, and distribute a product? Uh, that would be a cost analysis. That's something that uh, some of you may remember from GTT when we took that last year and did that shelf project. We used cost analysis on it. All right, so there you go. There's a practice exam. I will look into those two questions and post on the comments um, or post in the post when I post this to Edmodo. So uh, have a great day. We'll see you in our next video.